The most successful documentary that I've ever made was the result of an accident. And today we're gonna to talk about how we went from an eight minute YouTube video to a feature length documentary. What's up everyone, my name is JP and this month on the Stable Cyclist channel we are talking about all things Matahe Trail. And if you type Matahe into your YouTube search bar, the number one thing that will come up is the Matahe film. This is a documentary I released on February 2nd following the 2023 men's race at the Matahe 100. And if you haven't watched it yet, I would highly recommend that you hit pause right now and go watch that video first because today the participants of that film and the people who helped make it are gonna be talking about how we got it done behind the scenes. The film was originally supposed to be about me. We were working on a documentary that remains unfinished called Back to the Start. It's a documentary about how to restart your life after a serious mental health diagnosis and it was supposed to culminate with me starting the Matahe 100 last year. However, on July 6th, I was involved in a high-speed mountain bike crash and sustained a severe concussion that, if I'm honest, has continued to haunt me. Once I started to regain my bearings, though, I made a decision, essentially a gamble on myself. I had remaining budget money for this project, now with no end in sight. I had extensive previous documentary production experience and I had a SAG crew that still had time blocked out in their schedules to help me. So I contacted my SAG driver Aaron Haugen and asked him if he still wanted to go west with me, but instead of racing, we were going to do something else. No, not a clue what I was getting into and I, we'll talk about that and get into that here in a little bit I think. but. Um, when you called me, I suppose it was probably mid-July at that point, when you had kind of started to recover a little bit and told me you had the had a concussion and had the accident and let's just go film Tyler. And I was like, I don't know who Tyler is. And so now obviously <laughs> I do, but I was like, why not? Like we already had the weekend set aside. Um, both of us were able to get away and, and we were, had plans to race. Um, and so I, I think it's a little bit of a, a trust thing and just being like, ah, you might as well. Um, but also like there's a history of like, well, things that John films, like they tend to turn out all right. And so we're gonna, let's just go see what happens. And if, if we get like an eight to 10 minute kind of short out of this thing from the weekend, then that's gonna be pretty cool. Once Aaron was on board, I contacted Tyler Huber. Tyler was planning to race the Matahe 100 is a really good friend of mine, and I asked him if we, Aaron and I, could chase him around the Badlands and film him on race day. When John said that he's gonna come uh, come film me instead of him, and the storyline uh, for the Matahe was gonna just kinda follow uh, my race in my day, I don't know, I didn't really change anything. I was just gonna still line up and, and go do my race, and uh, I wasn't gonna change my plan uh, to cater to him, and I don't think he expected that. So uh, if he wants to, you know, have a video camera in front of me at the aid stations and, you know, ride alongside me on a gravel road every once in a while, I'm probably not even going to notice or pay much attention. So I was like, yep, sounds good. Like, let's do it. <laughs> People need to understand, initially we were part of the support team for Tyler then. And we were a part of meetings with Tyler and Melissa of like, we're gonna have to run SAG at some point because the river was too high. So we were gonna have to split the difference. And this plan involved me having to cross the river on my bicycle, uh, on my mountain bike, and then catching up with whoever was on the back half and continuing to film. When we got to Watford City for packet pickup, we realized that plans were starting to change dramatically for the weekend. It was going to rain hard on Friday and it was going to continue to rain into Saturday. And so um, we, had to, we had to make some big decisions. Some of the hardest decisions that my wife Lindsay and I have, have had to make as race directors. The Finnish town of Medora is under a flood watch. So the first decision that Nick and Lindsay make is to turn the course from a point to point course to an out and back course starting and ending at the northern terminus at CCC Campground. 
uh, my assistant race director, Mike Haas, and I drove down here and looked at the trail and we were like, we gotta push it back to Sunday. <laughs> and, uh, and so yeah, we announced based on everybody's you know, feed, feedback, pictures of the trail, scouts, um, yeah, we bumped it back to Sunday and it was the right decision. With an extra day, Aaron and I headed out to scout shooting locations, shoot a lot of B-roll, and ultimately scout trail conditions for race director Nick Yabara. Anytime we had cell service, I would call Nick and talk him through what we were seeing and send pictures if I could. The race being moved back a day was probably the biggest advantage I had as far as filming goes for a couple different reasons. But first off, like as much time as I've spent out there in the past, like not once have I knowingly been on the Matahe Trail. I've spent so little time around mountain biking and like the courses, like I've, I've been around Medora when it's dry and when it's like just this arid desert and I've been around when it's wet a little bit, um, but I didn't know what the Matahe race was like. It would have just been a whirlwind, whirlwind and it, things would have turned out, but it wouldn't have been the same with the, day, with the race being moved back. So we were able to go out and film we probably left by 8.30 or 9 in the morning, Saturday morning then, and we didn't get back to the campsite till probably 7, 7.30 that night, if I remember right. And so we were out for 10 hours um, and driving the course, which really helped me. Um, and then also like just getting to like hike into different spots and kind of plan out a little bit of like, okay, if we're here, then we can maybe shoot from this angle and start to see like how the race is going to form. I brought one pair of shoes with only, um, plus what I was wearing on my feet. Now the good news is the pair of shoes I brought with are my mountain bike shoes to ride on my mountain bike into certain locations tomorrow during the race. The bad news is, is the other pair of footwear I brought with are the Crocs that I was wearing yesterday morning when I walked out to my car. So hiking today could be a little bit of an adventure and in general, the trail was drying out steadily with one glaring exception. We are almost the Devil's Pass. We are hiking in and parked out on the road and we're taking the Goat Pass road to get there. As we're walking in, we see fresh mountain lion tracks all over on the trail. So, we have a general idea that we're being watched while we're out here. Got like a little jiggity jig and we'll be, we'll be there. You having fun? Yeah. And so I still didn't have a clue what we were doing. Um, but we got to this point where like the slickest clay you can think of. Cause it was like probably eight to 10 full strides to try to get up this thing. And I'm like grabbing sticks, trying to like weasel our way up but also holding on to cameras and all of the other stuff that we had with us um, and when we got up to like the this last little bluff i looked and it looks like this narrowest strip of like creation and there's kind of fence posts hanging out of it um and i looked at it and i was like people bike over this like, this is insanity. <laughs> we get done taking all the footage we need and all the photos we need. There's actually three bars of service out on top of Devil's Pass, and so I make a bunch of phone calls to Nick on trail conditions. I make a call to Tyler as well about the trail conditions, and then we decide it's time to head back, except for the trail is ridiculously slick. Because like for us to get up on the bluff, we had to go on the little bit right at the end. And like going back, we're like, that's going to be the 20th hard yards to safely get down. Um, you know, and granted, we're... <laughs> oh, the poor DSLR. The skid marks are great. Don't tell how great. You're like, I'm going to take some little steps and just go down here. And like two steps like feet way over your head tripod flies camera flies and like you landed flat on your back and i'm standing at the top like i just missed the greatest filming that we could have had all weekend
Uh, fresh change of clothes for both of us after uh, biting it on the way back down Devil's Pass. And now onwards. And we're talking with Nick, the event organizer. Uh, kind of trail reports as we go. So it's all our fault, whatever they decide. Just kidding. When we got back to CCC Campground, we met Melissa and Tyler one more time to go over everything. We did some interviews with them. We hiked around and took a look at how the race would re-enter the campground for the back portion of the course. And everyone retreated for the night to sleep and prep for what would be an epically long race day. And very quickly, I start to show that like my ability to make good decisions, like the accident remnants are lingering longer than they should be. And my ability to make like in the moment decisions is poor. We stop and get a, <laughs> we stop. I think it was at check B and like I'm up the trail, probably half a mile with a couple different GoPros and a camera on a tripod. <laughs> and you call me and you're like, yeah, I forgot to put batteries in the drone. <laughs> and I was like, okay, uh, how are like? Well, I'm glad you were paying attention. Holy. I didn't get anything. Actually. I got it on that GoPro, that's it. Cut. There's some, there's continued like check boxes of like, we're missing this footage and then we're missing this footage. So that was a surprise. Holy crap. Uh, I wasn't quite ready talking to some lady and I hear riders coming and Tyler's out in front with Kelly. So yeah, wheel to wheel. Known Your each other for a long time. Here. What? Your bike's down. Oh yep. Good catch. Yeah. I don't know how we're gonna have enough stuff to actually put together a film without significant behind the scenes work afterwards. The realization that I was a disaster didn't come till a week or two later going through footage and listening to our interactions. But on the day it wasn't, I don't, I didn't feel like, man, the train's going off the tracks here. And then we get to the point where we're like, now I'm supposed to drop you off later in the day and just let you go. And like you're, you're sharp enough to like, we were on the same page with the plan. The plan was actually running relatively smoothly overall, as far as like, get to this point, run out, you're here, you're here, you're here. When I, when I said, hey, drop me off at check A, I'm gonna ride in seven miles to the top of Never Ending to, to film these epic shots of Tyler or whoever's in the lead. At the time, it didn't feel like this was a dangerous proposition or something stupid that I was about to go do. No, I had, I had no doubts uh you were gonna get there like th there's that no doubt in my mind like you were gonna be safe i wasn't concerned about that um i also had no clue if we were gonna get anything video wise and it turned out we did and it was fantastic um but it was about the only thing i did right all day to be <laughs> totally <laughs> honest on the camera uh for people that have watched the documentary or that um are gonna go watch it any, almost anything you see during the race itself, you shot it. Because I was I was such a mess trying to remember to do things or not being able to remember, except for the stuff that you see late when Tyler's out in the lead and the music's really epic and he's heading back to camp. But pretty much anything else was, was your doing. Um, the only other shot that I got that was a success was when I hopped on the bike and rode next to them on the road while you were you were waiting for me up ahead uh, and Kyle left which was driving our vehicle back to us so th there was a lot of coordination of things but yeah most most of what you see in the documentary is because of Aaron just being steady all day and not even necessarily knowing what you should be shooting or what what you uh, were supposed to shoot but you just did <laughs> I like the anticipation but uh, yeah last couple of days for sure the challenge all day has been to stay neutral in all of this 
And to me, it's always the challenge when you make a documentary about people that you love and care about is you're trying to remain objective. And you're also trying to stay out of the way. In different points, I was aware. I mean, when, so when you're racing the Madahe, it's um, very isolated. It's very, there's, there's sections where it's just desolate, right? You're not seeing another human being. You're not seeing another anything for, for minutes and minutes and sometimes even hours. Um, so in those situations where you would like poke out of somewhere, or you'd be standing there, then I'd notice you. But in other situations where we'd cruise through an aid station or maybe you're hiding off the side of some place that is like a side of a bluff or something, kind of uh, probably trying to purposely um, hide yourself from me, I mean, maybe so I wouldn't react to you or something, um, I wouldn't notice you. Howdy, howdy. In the documentary, I know there's the part where uh, uh, after I'd caught Kelly on the way out and he and I were riding together, and I know I come towards the camera and I, I say, howdy, howdy, which I've realized I say that a lot now, like even in the halls at work when I'm passing people, um, that uh, of course I was aware of you there and I, and I saw you there. And also you guys are my friends. So it's like, hey, I, you know, you're out there and you're seeing so few people on that trail. When you see somebody, you're going to say hi to them. And then when it's your friend, you're going to be even kind of probably even a little bit more excited. Like, hey, how's it going? You know, kind of like, what's up? How's he, how's he doing? Like, Kelly was like... Kelly was back probably like four to five minutes. Okay. And I talked to Ryan, his fake guy, and he said, Kelly said that he's getting him too. Okay. But By this point, Aaron and I were no longer neutral. Like I said before, Tyler is a good friend, and literally anytime I'm in Bismarck, I have stayed at their house. My kids and their kids are friends, and so as Tyler, this amateur in this story, is on the verge of pulling off this great victory, I couldn't resist showing my feelings. So I'm very concentrated on what Tyler's doing and in my head I'm like he has a five minute lead let's go and all of a sudden I hear a bike going into the first corner at the top of never ending it does not lock its brakes up and I thought to myself uh oh that's Kelly and that was definitely not five minutes and it turns out it was 90 seconds from there Tyler heads out to long X Kelly's hot on his heels then there's the infamous wrong turn the savagery of Long X, Tyler's shoe exploding, and then the thumbs up where we ripped up the script and ultimately you got a full documentary. Uh, as it goes, because like you said, initially this was totally 100% gonna be a film about Tyler. I wanna talk about how disappointed we were the, the day ended like and, and I have to say I, like I'm honest about this and I was honest with Kelly about it even though he has become a very close friend of mine through this process the shot where you do see how we felt about him winning is he comes around the last corner and I step out into the gravel road and I give him a thumbs up and I was just to be totally honest I was being polite yeah. because I was in my my internal dialogue was like what are we gonna do now? Like we we had this story about this amateur winning and it didn't happen. And now what? Kelly at the end of the at the Medora premiere asked you, like, did you get footage of me right after I finished? And I was like crying on the ground, and you said <laughs> No. I was so furious and irate <laughs> because I'm set up behind the finish line and I don't know who's gonna come through first. So no matter who comes through like I have to film and somebody comes around the corner. I hit record and I'm standing behind the camera, thankfully, probably because I'm sure I hit record and my head just hung. And I was just <laughs> like, you got to be kidding me. And same thing as you, like you yeah. knew Kelly a little bit and interacted yeah. with him a little bit. I didn't know him at all. And you had said, he seems like a great guy. And I was like, okay, like cool. But like our guy is not like our guy's the guy. And he's not on camera. Our right story now. just got ripped up. Yeah, like, <laughs> and so I, I film him. He comes through the finish line. I figured like that it was important that we get the winner because somehow it's gonna tie in. 
Um, and he's he's very emotional coming before he even crosses the line. Um, and then like he crosses and stops and I cut the camera and then he's like on the ground crying and super emotional. Like I'm behind the camera, like literally kicking the ground, like <laughs> the cartoons, like because I'm so frustrated that Tyler didn't win. And it was like a great day for Tyler, you know, like second yeah, play, yeah. like, you know, <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. It, it was just in our view of like, we're trying to tell a story and the story didn't turn out quite how we had thought it would with 10 miles to go. And we didn't quite know what to do with that. And that was, you know, we got in the car that night, drove back to Tyler's house because that's where we were going to stay yeah. that night. So this is a long conversation that we have from Watford, essentially probably the pretty much the whole way yeah. to Bismarck. The realization quickly becomes like, ah, we, we kind of got to include Kelly. I was mainly worried that if I didn't bring Kelly into the story, he would become the villain in this story. And I couldn't tell a story about the Matahe if its greatest winner ever becomes the villain. People are oblivious to the fact that it was written almost entirely post-script. Uh, other than like what happened in the race, but how we went about making the doc was entirely like reverse engineering this. And I want to hear like on camera what your response was when you got that text from me that was like, well, I think we got to bring you into this, man. So, you know, after the race, um, when, when I start to realize, uh, the, the kind of the gravity of the situation maybe for Tyler, also for you as a filmmaker, and having that being a filmmaker as my, my career. I, I definitely, I think I told my wife, Rachel, I was like, I have a feeling I might be getting a message. And, um, but I got your text, I was like, all right, man. I, I'm like, I am happy to talk about Tyler. I'm happy to talk about the day and you know share my thoughts on what happened. Um, and so I, I was actually kind of excited to do that. And I immediately thought, I was like, well, how are we going to do this? And like, I think I could help facilitate it, you know, just g given my circumstances. So I had no idea what you're going to do with it, though, to be clear. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that you reached out and you were like, hey, man, I just want to put you on camera so you're not the villain. The great challenge becomes I can drive back out to Bismarck and interview Tyler again. I can drive back out to Bismarck and interview Melissa it's pretty hard for me to get to Denver, Colorado and interview Kelly or to get to Las Vegas and interview his SAG driver, Ryan. And logistics became the puzzle we had to solve. So as a documentary filmmaker myself, um, we, we don't just go into someone's house, put a camera on a tripod and, and say, talk away, you know, like you, it's just every, there's so many like technical aspects to, to first of all, making an interview look good and sound good. That's number one, right? And for you, I'm not going to record something on my iPhone for you when it's when it's an interview that I'm, I'm guessing you're going to probably use a lot, right? Um, and so our cinematographer Luke Askelson, he's I, he and I have worked together for years. Um, he's also one of my closest friends, and I was like, hey man, is there any chance I, I can borrow a camera, or actually a light? You know, can I borrow a light from you? Um, I want to set up um, in the garage, maybe just get your eyes on this, but I'll do all the work. And he was like, yeah, man, no problem. He's like very soft spoken. And he shows up with a truck full of gear. He comes in, he sets everything up and, and the studio space kind of over there. Um, and he dials it in like he dials it in like like we're shooting an interview with, you know, Chris Christopherson or something. You know, he, he really like dials everything in. And uh, and then I think he's like, I got to head out to dinner. <laughs> and so and which actually in our, in our situation, since you're shooting it with one camera, um, that simplified things. And it kind of made the space yeah. um, for me. I didn't have anyone else around. It was just you and me talking to each other. You were just in Minnesota and I was in Colorado. So, um, you know, the, the fun part about that was was uh, once Luke came in and you and I kind of came up with our time on this. Um, I knew that I was going to just have you on like FaceTime on my laptop sitting in a chair. I think I'd like set you on a chair <laughs> so I could like right next to the camera so I can almost be looking at you, but then look into the camera. So Luke, man, you know, Luke got this looking so nice. Um, 
And I just sat down in this chair and it was pretty cool because like I said, there was no one else around. So I felt pretty safe just talking about whatever. Um, I was pretty open about a lot of stuff with you and uh, it was a very chill environment. But um, I think that's the first time I'd ever done anything like that where we actually have an entire film set fully set up here. Um, I was recording it onto our cameras, obviously, our camera obviously, and then recorded audio separately. And then I just, uh, just like I do in all my movies, you know, put it into the <laughs> editing software and uh, I just spit out all the raw footage to you. So, I mean, I, I would never have had any of the success in any of my bike racing uh, without people that, that are there to help you and there to support you and are a part of the mission. I personally think no more so than in 24 hour racing and specifically the Mata Hay 100. That's a point to point race. And so you have to have somebody that knows their way around the Badlands. They need to know timing. They need to have a vehicle that can drive through the river. My cousin Ryan has, has been just so selfless and just so professional about. With more background information just being needed, um, Kelly's main say guy is his cousin Ryan. And Ryan's at so many races and there's footage in the documentary of him from years ago and just working and he and Kelly are honestly a, a really, really well-oiled machine. Um, and so how did, how did you go about contacting him? How did you go about getting his interviews set up and making sure that like that part of the story is a, a closed loop instead of just kind of dangling out there? Yeah, I, I knew that Ryan was like very technologically savvy. Um, and so I knew we, we initially had a plan, a plan where I was going to mail him some gear to make it all work. Uh, and then we we're going to do something kind of similar to what Kelly and I did. And Ryan lives out in Vegas. And then Ryan was like, well, actually, I'll be in Fargo for a work trip. And and I was like, OK, well, I'll like come to your hotel. And then he was like, well, actually, my part of my work trip got canceled here. I'm going to come to you. And so we, uh, you know, my house at 8 p.m. isn't real conducive to for an hour and a half sit down interview with five kids running around and a dog and my wife and everybody. Here. Like, so I asked one of my neighbors, I said, hey, can I come and like set up in your barn and it'll be silent. Um, their barn is not used anymore. It's just storage. And uh, they were like, yeah, come on over. So Ryan and I met there, uh, shot an interview. And again, like. You, you, I knew what I had gotten out of Melissa, and it was like gold, right? But you don't always know when you have, you're talking to like a support person, how much storytelling they're gonna give you. And again, I sat down with Ryan and I was like, it'll be a 20 minute interview. And an hour later we were done, and I was like, oh my goodness. And, and you watch the documentary and you're like, Ryan's in there for like three clips. And I'm like, yeah, that, that's all we could like fit. But there's all kinds of stuff, and some of it this month, uh, on YouTube, I'm putting out different videos, and one of them is about SAG support. And you'll see a lot more of that Ryan interview that right. ended up on the cutting room floor for the doc because it's just such good stuff. But that's how, you know, Ryan ended up in the doc, Kelly ended up in the doc, all these people far away ended up sitting down with me, sometimes in person, sometimes not. So how did, how did you guys go about planning and how did you guys go about shooting the footage of him when he was riding out in Colorado? That's at the beginning of the documentary. Yeah, so that was actually the very last uh, shots or those were the last shots that happened. Um, we got, or I got very late in the like writing process and I was almost done and I knew like I needed some kind of calm. There's not a lot of calm in this film. You know, it's, it's kind of like wall-to-wall -wall action. And I was like, I, I really need some calm. And I needed a way to get him not in a race setting, just riding his bike. And so I said, uh, hey, Kelly, like, I got one more ask. Um, can you get somebody just, like, have you riding your bike? And, and I said, like, you can shoot it on an iPhone. I don't care. Like, I just need footage. 
You know, and I know I could have, we could have shot it on an iPhone and, and truthfully, the cameras are getting so good these days. You would, you would have been able to work with it. It would have been fine. Yeah. However, um, Luke and I have also worked on a lot of cycling specific projects for, for, um, big bike brands and we've traveled around the world together. I just, I called Luke again and I was like, man, um, <laughs> I owe him a lot of favors, as you can yeah, probably yeah. tell. Uh, no, he, he, as he was do super I. happy to help. No, no, no. <laughs> he was super happy to help. And I was like, hey, Luke, how about you just get, get me riding around my neighborhood a little bit? Like, we'll get some stuff in the garage. And he's like, yeah, man, absolutely. Um, we need a driver. So I, I called my friend Hunter Burnett, who's a musician, and uh, he slings coffee, one of the best baristas in Denver. And I was like, hey, do you mind driving a truck with a cameraman on the back? And you can't accelerate too fast because they'll fly off the back. And you can't slow down because they'll, you know, and then you can't run me over. So he's like, sure. <laughs> so so Hunter came over, Luke came over. Luke comes over with a, a, a truck full of gear. But Luke, just being the total pro, you know, came in and yeah, he lit that scene and we shot a bunch of footage for you. Yeah, and then we just did, we did a couple laps around the neighborhood and uh, Hunter did a great job driving. And yeah, but it felt like old school for Luke and I. Yeah, no, that was for pretty sure. fun. And then we uh, sent that footage off to you, praying that it was going to be good enough. And uh, <laughs> it, made, it made it in the movie. So, At what point during that process were you like, I think this might be a little bit bigger than I thought it was going to be? It was probably when you, uh, the time that you came over and you showed, I can't remember what it was. Maybe it was like 10 minutes or something that we watched uh, in my basement. Um that time and then that's when it kind of clicked with me like okay this is this is like a production like this is going to be this is going to be something beyond just like a you know a five minute deal or a whatever deal um and and it felt like it was going to become like like it was going to be real like it was going to be like something that that uh that was a little more uh a little more monumental and kind of uh a little bit more special i guess um to me and it's not like saying that a, a little short thing wouldn't have been special Everything was abstract, though. I hadn't seen anything. You know, all this footage was being taken, yada, yada, yada. I'm going back to my life. I just got done training for six months pretty hard for this race. I kind of just wanted to return back to my job in reality and just eat hot dogs and drink beer for a couple months. Um, so I kind of put it out of my mind, to be honest with you. And uh, and, then you, and then you started showing me kind of the proof of uh, the proof of the labor you were putting in there. I was like, okay, yeah, this thing's, this thing's going to be legit. This is going to be real. And then you and, and Kelly and I and some others kind of started talking more regularly. Um, you know, the more refined interviews started to kind of happen. Um, and uh, then you showed me some of the clips and um, kind of the work you're putting into it and these return trips you were doing. I was like, okay, like this is this is going to be good. Like this is this is really going to be something. And, and yeah, I was I was stoked with the final product. I think most everyone who has seen it has had that exact same response. So. When your friends tell you something is good, you, you know, you don't always know what, like your BS meter can't read that always or detect that. Um, so, you know, when you and, and some of my other close friends would be like, yeah, this is really good. I was always like, okay, thanks guys. <laughs> um, when we did the two premieres and, and Kelly had told me this a lot ahead of time, he's like, you need to do premieres so you can sit in the room with a bunch of people and just watch them react. And I was like, eh, whatever, man. And when we sat in Medora and then we sat in Bismarck, uh, and the Bismarck one especially, and I watched Total Strangers respond to this in the same way that my friends had responded to it, I, I was like, okay, I think, I think we're kind of you know, cooking with gas here. It gets to be February 2nd and I'm in Denver and we had had a really good premiere on the first. And, you know, Kelly's like, what do you want to do today? And I'm like, I don't want to sit around and wait for this thing to come out and just watch metrics on YouTube. So we end up walking it, you know, going up to Red Rocks and hiking around and just like literally driving around in the mountains. And I remember, I think the second day it was out, it did like 7,000 views. And like most of my videos, you know, like they're about a very specific thing. They're about mental health in the bike world. So the audience is very small. Um, the the people who follow this channel are very loyal, uh, but but it's niche for sure. And most of my videos, like if I would get a really good video, it was like you know, like 500. Right? I would be like doing a cartwheel, and so I'm like, why, like 7,000? And I'm getting like within 60 minutes, I'm getting like 
1,800 views. And I'm like, what is going on? Right. Yeah, I mean, I still have a tough time even digesting it that way, to be honest with you. Um, I think it's it's really cool that people uh, take to it and like enjoy my story. And uh, and uh, I, I've gotten a lot of messages about it, a lot of compliments, a lot of, you know, hey, that's awesome kind of deals. Um, but the truth of the matter is I've just, I've been doing the same thing for so long that it was kind of weird to me in a sense that like all of a sudden, because you did such a good job of making this documentary, showing a day out there on the trail, showing this race take place and what actually happens out there, that all of a sudden people are like, oh, this is awesome. You do this and this is so great. And this is, you know, what a great story. It's like, well, yeah, man, I did that last year and the year before too. Like, this is kind of, this is kind of what I do, you know, uh, my boss shared the link with our entire office like our corporate office he sent a link and um gave me kudos and he's a great guy um that just does that kind of stuff on a regular basis but i don't um share that kind of stuff with a lot of my coworkers on a day-to-day -day basis because i just whatever just they, they have the, i have my hobbies they have theirs and a lot of them have came up to me and just like holy cow that's crazy you did that this is awesome and and uh, I think, uh, if anything, it's made people more aware of mountain biking in our area and, and help promote that. I mean, I, I was so excited when I saw the trailer, but once I saw the whole film, I just thought, I was so blown away. I was so impressed and I was so excited um, for how it was going to make people excited for the Monahay. And so that's, that's when it really hit me. I was like, man, JP did a phenomenal job. Uh, telling this story and I was like, I, I think he needs to do this again Next year the plan is to be there again with an even bigger crew helping Aaron and I Find more stories and tell them from race day Ultimately though you have all made this project the success it has been the sharing metrics on YouTube have been Mind-blowing to say the least to see so many of you sharing this film. So thank you It went really well, quick, easy. Uh, was 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 uh, was back on the trail fast. Um, saw Tinker. But you ended up shaking hands with her. Yeah, we shook hands. Yeah. So uh, so our plan was uh, so there's three aid stations we were gonna meet at, and we did meet up. And uh, aid one rolled in there, did the bottle swap, reached my hand out to grab the gels, and she didn't have anything for me, so she just reached her hand out. We shook hands really awkwardly. Um, it was awesome. It was very memorable. Um, so after that, I took off. I can hear you. Can you see me? Hadn't uh, after I hadn't seen you in quite some time. Okay, okay. Uh, and then John Peter, you came to Bismarck. Okay, so wait a minute. Okay. Can't use you at all. Can't use you at all? I'm all but I'm talking to you. But you can really talk to Aaron. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? Like, okay, okay, yeah. Oh, okay, I got you. Okay, this is what this isn't for the YouTube, this is for the documentary. It could be both. Okay, okay. Let me just start over. Yep. Okay, start you 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 asked me the question you wanted me to answer again. Alright. Uh, how did we arrive here? Can we talk more about us how Awesome, Kelly is for a second as just a human being. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay. Yep. Let's do that. Go ahead. No, I got nothing. I was oh, just gonna I, say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, had an awesome ride and uh, probably the most memorable ride that I had on the trail. Um, yeah, to this date. Um, you met me that day too, so that was like memorable. <laughs> yeah, and I met John Peter at the beginning of the Matahe 2019, which is by far the most memorable experience I've ever had in my life. <laughs>